Someone once said that dogs have more friends than humans because they wag their tails instead of their tongue. Will Rogers once said, we should so live that we wouldn't be afraid to sell the family parrot to the town gossip. Yeah, you know, we've been studying uh, a, a study of wisdom with our words from the book of Proverbs because words have power. Words have the power of life and death. They have the power to heal and to hurt. They have the power to uh, bring peace or produce conflict. And so we want to know the, the wise use of our words. And Proverbs contrasts us contrast the wise use of our words with unwise use of our words. And we focus for these first few weeks on the unwise use of words, lying, gossip, flattery, boasting, jesting, and perverse speaking. This morning we come to one more of those unwise use of words, and that is the unwise use of contentious words, words that bring conflict and strife. So as we look at these, we want to know what they are, uh, who uses them, uh, what they do to us, and how do we fix it? So from God's Word, the Holy Scriptures gives us several insights about contentious words. First of all, we want to look at the meaning of contentious words. The Hebrew word for contention has the idea of strife, quarreling, scolding, conflict. So contentious words then are words that cause tension and conflict and quarreling and strife. So whatever causes those, whatever kind of words cause those things, those are contentious words. And there's a lot of words that fall under that category. And we'll be looking at several of those. The idea behind the Hebrew word for strife is to agitate or irritate in such a way it stirs you up on the inside. And uh, a lot of words do that to us. And so even our English word contention, con meaning with, tension meaning that which brings tense situations, uh, it indicates uh, with tension, words spoken with tension that produce tension. So that's the meaning of contentious words. Let's look at some examples of contentious words. And uh, there are a lot of contentious words. I'm going to look at six contentious words, but there's much more than these. But these are probably the most prevalent kinds of contentious words that we might use. The first is arguing words, words that produce an argument or that come from an argument. You know, some people love to argue. You know who they are. If you say yes, what are they going to say? No. And if you say, uh, well, uh, yes, it is, and they're going to say, no, it isn't. They just love to, to stir up things up. They love to produce conflict. They love to argue. Now, when you argue with somebody, it's, you're disagreeing with them, and you're stating your point of view, usually to get them to come along to your point of view. That's why you're presenting an argument. And it's okay to do that, but the problem is that we sometimes disagree in a disagreeable manner, and that's when it produces contention. So it's okay to uh, disagree with somebody, and it's okay to uh, have differing opinions, but it's not okay to present those in disagreeable ways, in ways that produce conflict and strife. So you want to give reasons and cite evidence for support of your ideas and your actions, and, and typically you want to persuade others to come to your conclusion. That may not always happen. There may be uh, disagreements and differing opinions, but we don't have to be disagreeable over it, and that's the key. Another example of contentious words are quarreling words. Now, when we go from arguing to quarreling, you go beyond just presenting your case. Now there's an element of anger introduced to it. 
because now you're these are these are fighting words. <laughs> you 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 want you know what your opinion you think it's right and and you think the other person's wrong and so now there's an element of of tension and anger and and that and and usually there's an increase in volume because the you think the louder you speak the the more you're going to get your point across and so uh, quarreling is an angry dispute, an angry disagreement. That's when it proceeds into quarreling. And usually there's a, uh, it's a conflict between uh, two people, two differing opinions or two differing viewpoints, and it, it, it digresses from being disagreeable to, to being uh, well, just fighting over this. And so... Um, and usually this happens because each of us have words that trigger an angry response. And we call it today, you push their button. Yeah, We all have buttons, and, and people we know and love know what those buttons are. And sometimes when they're angry with us, they'll push that button. You know what yours is. I know what mine is. Uh, but, yeah, when you're angry, you just push that button because you want to get your point across. And that's the, that's the thing. And, and a couple of these words that kind of push our buttons are you always, or you never. And those are, those are fighting words, you know, and, uh, Usually we're, they're said in anger. They're said in order to, to really escalate things. And, uh, and sometimes, um, other words will come up. Well, you did this and you bring up some past mistakes some past failure eh, because you're pushing that button and, or sometimes, uh, you didn't do that when you know you should have, and it's brought up over and over again. And, uh, yeah, so quarreling words. And usually this comes because uh, of the flesh. You know, we all have a sin nature, this fleshly nature in us. And and uh, I've counseled couples over the years, and not just in this church, but in other churches as well. Uh, there was a missionary couple that one would say something in the flesh, and the other would respond in the flesh. And pretty soon there was this, spiraling cycle that would go downward in the use of unkind, hateful, and perverse words. Now, these are from missionaries. Pastors aren't exempt from this either. So it's quarreling words, and, and so we need to be careful of this. And we'll see how in just a minute. Another example of contentious words are sarcastic words. These sarcastic words are the use of irony to mock or convey contempt. And so usually it's done in anger because, you know, we want to get under their skin. Uh, so uh, we, we know that Jesus was, was, a, was an example of this, and uh, satirical, ironic utterances designed to hurt. Now, uh, and they, they mock Jesus, Oh, hail, king of the Jews. And so what they do? They put a crown of thorns and drove it into his head, you know, and began to mock him as, as king. Uh, and so these are sarcastic words. They, uh, someone once in, said in sarcasm, if, if you were incarnated, you'd be a dog. And of course, the response was, yeah, and you'd be my luck. And you'd be kind of a flea. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's that's sarcasm. It is. Some would say best. Others would say it's worst. Yeah, but you 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 know how to use it. We all do sometimes, and we need to be careful of that because that can produce contention and conflict and strife. Another example of contentious words are just talking back words. This is replying rudely to somebody. You know, they want you to do something and, and you don't want to do it, so you just mumble something under your breath. Well, nah, that'll be the day. And, uh, or you just, uh, usually this happens between parents and children or, and, or children and teachers and, and things. You know, you just, uh, you, you, you're instructed to do something, you don't want to do it, and so you just kind of lash back or you mumble something under your breath. And, 
and that produces consequences that aren't pleasant either. And those are contentious words, that uh, something that displays rebellion and attitude of, of pride and rebellion, and we need to be careful about that. Uh, then there are reviling words, and this escalates to where uh, it's criticism in a, an abusive or angry way where you're insulting somebody. And so this is designed uh, to, to hurt Today, a, a person who uh, uses reviling words would be called a verbal abuser. And so, and, and here, think of the Pharisees and the scribes and the, uh, the leading priest as they, as they mocked Jesus, you know, and he was hanging on the cross. They said, oh, if you're the Messiah, then come down, you know, and, and lead us the, into the kingdom, you know, and uh, oh, you're the Savior. Well, well, save yourself and us. And, you know, these were reviling words. And you know what the Bible says that Jesus, how Jesus responded to that? Peter tells us in the first letter he wrote in chapter 2, verse 23 of 1 Peter, it says, being reviled, he did not revile in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats, but he kept entrusting himself to the one who judges righteously. And sometimes that's where we need to be. And when we are on the receiving end of these contentious words, we need to um, be one who is entrusting ourselves to the one who judges righteously. Let God come to our defense. And so, and Jesus, it says the very next verse, says he, he himself bore our sins on the cross so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. So we need to, instead of reviling somebody, just give a blessing. So instead of, uh, of tearing somebody up, just build them up, encourage them. When, when they say something that's cutting, and you say something that's nice, just counter that with something that's, that's productive. Another and final example that we'll talk about this morning is harsh words. These are hurtful words spoken in anger. Proverbs 15, 1 tells us that a gentle answer turns away wrath and a harsh word stirs up anger. So you want to stir things up? You know, you can use arguing words, you can quarrel, you can use sarcastic remarks, you can talk back, you can revile them. Or you can just simply come back with, with rude and, and harsh remarks. And these are, the Hebrew word for harsh has the idea of hurtful in it. You're, these are words designed to hurt. So you've gone well past, you know, just presenting an idea or an argument in favor of, a, of some opinion or idea. Now, now you've gone with the idea to, to hurt. And this happens in relationships between husbands and wives, between parents and children, between bosses and employees and, and colleagues at work and people in church. It just, uh, we, we know how to use those harsh words, and we need to be careful about that. So there are all kinds of contentious words that come out of our mouth, and we need to be knowledgeable about them, and we also need to be careful not to to use them, not to respond. When we're receiving these things, and we do on a regular basis, uh, whether you're at home, at work, at church, or in your neighborhood, sometimes you're going to be the receiver of these harsh, uh, um, contentious words. How do we respond? And if we respond by using the same kind of things that are told to us, it's just going to escalate and produce further conflict and strife and tension. You ease the conflict. You ease the tension and strife when you receive these words and you give something different back. You, you speak words of grace. You speak words of blessing. You speak words of encouragement. You speak words of kindness. And so you're, you're, and, and that will de-escalate the situation most of the time. And so uh, we need to be careful about these words. So we've seen what these words mean, what contentious words are, and now we want to look at where they come from. Contentious words come from a contentious person. 
Makes sense, doesn't it? Uh, the Bible gives us uh, pictures of, of eight kinds of contentious people, in, particularly in the book of Proverbs, but other places as well. And the first kind of contentious person is one, the Bible says, who drinks too much wine. Now, this is in Proverbs chapter 23, verse 29 and 30. Who has woe? Who has sorrow? Who has contentions? Notice there's that word contention there. And this is the, the strife and conflict. Who has complaining? Who has wounds without cause? And who has redness of eyes? And he gives the answer in verse 30. Those who linger long over wine. Linger long over over wine. What do you do when you linger long over wine? You go from one to another, to another, to another, to another, and pretty soon you're drunk. And the Bible condemns drunkenness. And so we want to understand uh, when we are, when, when a person is drunk, they say and do things that, first of all, they don't mean, and secondly, that cause conflict and contention. And, uh, that's why you see so many fights and, and brawls work out in a, in a bar. You know, the people get drunk and they they get testy and they get angry and pretty soon they're coming to, coming to blows. And, and so, um, we need to be careful. This is a contentious person, one who gets drunk. Now, another kind of contentious person is one who mocks, uh, he goes on to say, not just those who linger over wine, those who taste mixed wine. Um, one who mocks is another kind of contentious person. Uh, Proverbs has a lot to say about the mocker, the scoffer. And uh, in Proverbs 22.10, it says, drive out the scoffer and contention will go out. Even strife and dishonor will, will cease. So when you... Uh, get rid of the one who is is mocking or scoffing or making fun. Uh, it says that's gonna when that happens, then you know strife, dishonor, contention. That's that's gonna that's gonna melt away. And so, but um, sometimes a uh, and you know people that are just contentious. It seems like by nature, you know, uh, they always uh, have something to to say about somebody or something that's not nice or not kind. And, and, uh, and so, uh, and they're always stirring things up. And so, um, it says drive out the mocker and contention will go out and strife and dishonor will cease. Another kind of contentious person is the, and we've talked about this, the whisperer. Uh, the one who tells secrets, reveals secrets, reveals things that are told to us in confidence, and all of a sudden we're blabbering that uh, to somebody that's, that is none of their business to know. So the whisperer is looking for conflict between people, and that's why they, they say, oh, did you know that so-and-so said this about you? Yeah. And so um, Proverbs 26, verse 20, for lack of wood, the fire goes out. And where there is no whisper, contention dies out. Now, the opposite is, is true. When you, when you put wood on fire, you know, it keeps going. And where there is a whisper, uh, contention doesn't quiet down. It escalates. And so uh, we need to, to see that uh, this is a kind of contention. There's a lot to say about one who is proud and conceited and self-centered and uh, arrogant. So Proverbs 28, 25, an arrogant man stirs up strife. So proud people just stir up conflict. They just want to stir things up. And, and sometimes it's because they don't get their own way because they're so self-absorbed. Uh, sometimes it's just everything's revolving around themselves and, and so when it doesn't go their way, then they, they get angry and they stir up conflict. And so an angry man, you know, stirs up strife, stir thing. And you, you've seen that happen. You've seen examples of that. And, and so have I, another kind of contentious person 
is the one with anger issues. And, uh, and we know those kinds of people as well. Uh, the Bible, in Proverbs in particular, talks a lot about anger issues, particularly as it, as it relates to causing strife and contention. Proverbs fifteen eighteen, a hot-tempered man stirs up strife. And so when we can't control our anger, uh, then we're, we tend to fly off the handle, handle quickly, we have a short fuse, and it escalates, and it just stirs up. It agitates people to the point of conflict. And so we need to be, be careful. I, I see this in husband and wife relationships. I see this in, in relationships between people at work, uh, people sometimes at church, uh, and, and things. They, uh, just people who are quick to fly off the handle, uh, they, they have anger issues, and it, it just stirs up conflict. And, and some of the anger issues are deep-seated. You know, we, we, get anger, we get angry because of maybe some past circumstances. We got some, some things that happened to us and uh, that we haven't gotten over, that, that people have hurt us badly or deeply or abused us and are taking advantage of us, and, and we're, we get angry over that. And we transfer that anger onto other people, and it produces conflict. It stirs up strife. Now, here's another kind of contentious person, and that is the one who is a dissatisfied spouse. Uh, and it can be either man or woman. Uh, Proverbs tends to uh, bring out the woman more than the man. Um, for example, Proverbs 27, uh, verse 15 and 16. A constant dripping on a day of steady rain and a contentious woman are alike. Uh, and, and how are they alike? Well, uh, the constant dripping on, on the day of steady rain, it, it's, it's kind of irritating. <laughs> and, it's, it, you know, and, and so a contentious woman uh, brings contention into a relationship, and it, it could be a marriage or it could be another kind of relationship, you know. Not necessarily a marriage relationship, so uh, but it brings it 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 irritates, and that irritation sometimes brings conflict and strife. Uh, two times uh, Proverbs tells us it's better to live in the corner of a roof than a house shared with a contentious woman, and there it is talking about a marriage relationship, and it mentions that twice. Proverbs twenty one nine and Proverbs twenty five twenty four say the exact same thing. Uh, better live on the corner of a roof than a house shared with a contentious woman. And Proverbs twenty one nineteen, it's better to live in a desert land than with a contentious and vexing woman. And so this you know, Solomon, in his wisdom, uh, said, you know, this is this is a real problem, and and so we need to be careful about this. Proverbs nineteen thirteen, a foolish son is a destruction to his father. And a contention, the contentions of a wife is a constant dripping. And uh, it's, it, this is beyond the irritation of just the, the rain, you know, dripping constantly. You know? And in uh, ancient cultures, constant dripping was a form of, tol- of torture. You know? And so this is, um, this is serious in terms of the, the, this kind of contentious person in a marriage relationship. And so... And we'll talk about what to do with that in, in just a minute. But another kind of contention person is one who meddles in the affairs of others. And uh, Proverbs presents a very graphic picture of the person and the consequences of interfering with a conflict that's not yours. And it says in Proverbs twenty six seventeen, like one who takes a dog by his ears, Pretty graphic picture. Yeah, if you grab a dog by its ears, even the pet that you love, and you grab that dog by its ears, what's he going to do? He's going to turn around and snap at you. He's going to bite you. And that's the picture here. And it says, like one who takes a dog by the ears is he who passes by and meddles with strife not belonging to him. You know, we have enough strife of our own. When we start entering into the strife of other people, 
then yeah, it's going to come back and bite us. That's what this proverb is telling us. Just be careful of the consequences of that. But uh, so one uh, contentious person is one who meddles in, in conflicts not their own. And you're going to get hurt if you jump into things that you're not either the solution or the problem. Then you jump into that, you're going to get, you're going to get hurt. So another kind of contentious person, and I'll just call him the carnal Christian. And this comes from uh, Paul's letter to the Corinthian church. The Corinthian church was a, a church, it was, I would describe it as a carnal church. They had all kinds of problems. There was divisions, there were lawsuits, there were uh, sexual immorality, there were all kinds of stuff taking place. And so in, he writes to them, Paul does in 1 Corinthians 3.3, 3, and he starts out, are you still fleshly? For since there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not fleshly? And the answer is yes, they were. And the word fleshly is carnal. It means they are operating from the direction and source of their flesh and not their flesh and bones, the desires of their fallen nature that's within them. And so, and he goes on and says, are you not walking like mere men? You're not walking in the spirit, you're walking in the flesh. You're walking like ordinary people, not Christians, not people who have Christ and his Holy Spirit dwelling inside of them. But you know what? When flesh meets flesh, there's conflict. And so that happens in whatever relationships you're dealing with, whether it's in a, uh, in a uh, marriage relationship, whether it's in a family relationship or a church relationship or business relationship. When we operate in the flesh, Sometimes people are going to respond in the flesh, and that's where contention happens. So I think a carnal Christian could be described as a, as a contentious person. The deeds of the flesh, according to Galatians chapter 5. Now, another insight. So we've looked at the meaning. We've looked at some examples. We've looked at the people who are contentious. Now let's look for a minute at contentious words that can harm us. They cause great harm. What are the consequences? What are the, the results of people that are using contentious words? And the sacred scriptures reveal six ways contentious words can harm us and other people. Uh, first of all, they can cause personal strife. This is within your own heart. You know, there's, there's strife within you. There's conflict. This is not outer conflict. This is inner conflict, you know, where there's a battle going on in our own self. Uh, and it's not just between the flesh and the spirit. It's, you know, in this inner conflict in our own soul. And so um, Proverbs 26, 21, like charcoal to hot embers and wood to fire, so is a contentious man to kindle strife. And this, this strife not only is external, and he kindles strife with other people, but it's also kindling strife in his own soul. So we need to be careful about this consequence because it produces internal strife, personal strife. Another thing that it causes, and great harm, is marital conflict. And we've seen this in terms of the contentious person. We've seen this in terms of the contentious words that are used. And, and so then it produces marital conflict. And as Proverbs reminds us, Proverbs 21, 19, it's better to live in a desert land far away from people than with a contentious and vexing woman. Uh, it's just marital conflict. And how do you solve that? What do you do with that? Well, you, you've got to be gracious and kind, and you, you begin to uh, let the Holy Spirit control your words, and you respond with grace rather than uh, insult, and you respond with kindness rather than harsh words, and you respond with words that are, are going to build up and edify. And, and so, yeah, these are things that, that we can do. But uh, Proverbs warns, warns us that um, we, need to, we need to reach out and, and help contentious people, and particularly here, a contentious and vexing woman. 
Another way that uh, it causes harm is in fair in marital dis or not just marital conflict, but family disharmony. Proverbs seventeen one. Better is a dry morsel and quietness with it than a house that is full of feasting with strife. You know, uh, growing up, my my brother and my parents just never got along. I mean, it, he was very rebellious, and uh, and it just you know meal time were just it was just conflict, and and sometimes I'd just like to go and just go off to the side, and not be a part of that. <laughs> And, and the, it's better to have a dry morsel, morsel and quietness with it than a house full of feasting and strife. And so uh, we live in a society today where there's a lot of, of conflict within the families. And, and that's, that just produces not just disharmony and dysfunction, but it, it causes great harm and, and damage to the people in the families. Now, the, another way contentious words cause us harm is damaged friendships. You know, there are friendships that just lay shipwrecked because of the damage that's come from contentious people using contentious words. And Proverbs gives us a couple examples of this. In Proverbs sixteen twenty eight, a perverse man speaks, spreads strife, and a slanderer separates intimate friends. So even a friendship, a good friendship, a close friendship is not immune to great harm from contentious words by contentious people in that friendship. Proverbs 17, 9, he who conceals a transgression seeks love, but he who repeats a matter separates intimate friends. That's why I say this whisper, you know, they, they separate intimate friends because they're repeating a confidence they're repeating something that was told to them in secret, expecting them to, to be confident and to keep confidence about that. And in our society, we're just not too good about that. And, uh, you know, knowledge is power. And, and if we know something about somebody that somebody else doesn't know, then we feel powerful and we want to share it with them. And Scripture said that can produce damaged friendships. It separates even close, intimate friends. Another way contentious words cause harm and can be in church divisions. And so Paul writes to this carnal church in Corinth in his first letter in the first chapter in the 10th verse, I exhort you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all agree and that there be no divisions among you. Some in the Corinthian church was saying, I'm of Paul. Another was saying, another group within the church saying, I'm of Peter. Another group in the church was saying, I'm of Christ. You know, they were all following these men, and they were all arguing and, and, and just uh, divided over that. And, and Paul is saying, that's not right. That's, that's carnal. That's fleshly. And, and when he says that you all agree and that there be no divisions in us, in a, in a group, in a church, you know, we're all going to have differing opinions. We're all not going to view the same Scripture the same way or have the exact same interpretation of Scripture. And this is not what this verse is saying. It, it's not saying you all agree uh, about an interpret the same interpretation of Scripture. It says you all agree and there be no divisions that there's no divisions resulting over the differences of opinion or interpretation over different verses. But I've seen and heard of church splits, you know, because of this. And, uh, you know, they have one group that believes this, and one group believes that, and pretty soon they're two different churches because they've split. And so Paul is just saying it ought not be that way. And, but it can cause church divisions. Um, another way contention can harm, and that is through team or group factions. And you can see this wherever there are groups of people. It could be in a church. It could be in a workplace. It could be in a school. It could be in a neighborhood. But where there are group or team factions and uh 
you know, Proverbs says that, that God hates certain things. There are certain things that God hates. There are six things that are abomination. And the, the seventh and last thing he says is one who spreads strife among brothers, among the brethren, if you will. In Galatians 5, Paul talked to the Galatian church about the difference between the fruit of the Spirit and the deeds of the flesh. He says in Galatians chapter 5, verse 20, the deeds of the flesh are idolatry, sorcery, enmities, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions. These are all coming from the flesh and not the spirit. And so, and this produces great harm, uh, not just in the marriage, not just in the, in the family, not just in churches, but in, in other groups within neighborhoods or church or, or in work or school, wherever there's groups where there can be factions, and, and these factions are, are not good. And so um, as we look at this, we say, okay, we've seen the meaning, we've seen some examples, we've seen some people who cause and who do a contentious people, and we've seen what these contentious people and contentious words do that cause great harm. So what causes all this? And I think if we go back to to the root cause, we need to know that contentious words are rooted in sin. And and that's why they're so destructive. That's why they're so harmful. And so as we look at the root cause of these contentious words and contentious people, I think we see, first of all, we need to understand that there's a deceitful heart that dwells within each one of us. And, you know, Jeremiah said that uh, our heart is deceitful. It's wicked among all, above all things. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 15, verse 18, the things that proceed out of the mouth that come from the heart and those defile the man. So we are people with a defiled heart, and, and so and out of this defiled heart comes contentious words and helps us and makes us uh, in terms of produces in us uh, sometimes uh, uh, cause us to be contentious, and we become a contentious person because we are, we're directed more by that deceitful heart than we are by God's Holy Spirit, and, and, or, and the Lord Jesus Christ willing in us. Now, these overlap because not only is there a deceitful heart, we also have this carnal sin nature within us. And so um, God's word reveals that uh, we have uh, this sinful nature. When Adam fell into sin, um, all of humanity got corrupted by that. And so every person who's ever been born has a corrupted sin nature that gives us a bent towards sin. And we all have sinned and come short of the glory of God because that sin nature causes us to sin, and we sin. And, and so this is, and, and this is kind of what Paul was explaining to the Corinthian church when he talks about this fleshly nature, this being of the flesh, you're, is jealousy, strife among you? Are you still not? Are you not fleshly? And this idea of the, of the flesh—it's this carnal, sinful nature that dwells within us. And is that the same thing as a defiled heart? Uh, well, Jeremiah said the heart is deceitful, and uh, I. Some people try to say it's the same thing. I think there may be a little difference there in in that. Uh, but that's the deceit, the sin nature that dwells within us also is a contributing factor uh, uh, to the rooted uh, sin that dwells within us. And uh, Paul talked in Romans 7. He says, I, I want to do something, but I, I don't do it, or I, I want to not to do something, I do it. And he says, it's not me, it's sin that dwells within me. That's what he's talking about, this fallen sinful nature we all have another thing that is rooted in sin and comes and causes these contentions is unrestrained selfishness 
And we all are selfish to a, a certain degree because of this sinful, corrupted sin nature that cries out for the flesh, for what we want, the desires of the flesh. And so James tells us in James chapter 1 and verse 4, what is the source of quarrels and conflicts among you? Now he's getting to the main issue, the root issue. What's the root issue that James tells us? He says, it's not the source your pleasures that wage war in your members. In other words, these sinful desires, uh, this cry out to satisfy yourself. And so that produces, and so we become self-absorbed, we become conceited, we become self-centered. The buzzword today is narcissistic. You know, you can call it by a lot of different labels, but basically it's the selfishness that we have inside of us, our pleasures that wage war against our members. Another root cause that fuels contentious words is uncontrolled anger. And we looked at that because anger issues and people with anger issues are people who are contentious. And so uncontrolled anger is certainly going to contribute and fuel contentious words. And that's another sin that's rooted within us. Proverbs 30, 20, 33, the churning of milk produces butter. So, and I've never done this, but I've seen pictures of it. You know, you, you have this big container and you have this milk and you have this thing that goes up and down and, and it, it agitates the milk until it becomes butter. Graphic picture. The pressing nose brings forth blood. You know, you continue to, to rub your nose and press your nose or you get socked in the nose and, and what? You get a bloody nose. Well, so the churning of anger produces strife. And so it comes back to these anger, this uncontrolled anger. And it may come from deep-seated anger issues that need to be dealt with, uh, and uh, either through, through counseling or, or, uh, and, and getting some help in dealing with the anger issues. But it is going to produce strife. So that's another um, contentious uh words that are rooted in, in uh, uncontrolled anger, that, and it produces a strife. And then there's also, and like I said, these overlap a lot. There's unchecked pride, and um, Proverbs talks a lot about the proud, conceited, self-centered person. And, and so Proverbs 13.10, through presumption comes nothing but strife. Presumption is, is the proud person just presuming the world revolves around him or her. And, and so everything, and so when it gets disrupted, they get angry. And, and when uh, they don't get their own way, they get angry. And the arrogant man, it says in Proverbs 28, 25, stirs up strife. We looked at a while ago. Um, so I think we'd all agree that each one of us at some time or another has been guilty of using contentious words or being a contentious person. And the reason is because we have this sinful nature inside of us. And some have anger issues, some have pride issues, and some have selfishness issues. Uh, we all deal with these. The question is, what can we do about it? So is there any hope? Is there any help for us but, and over this sinful nature that we have dwelling in us? And the answer is yes. And so well, I want to look at some, uh, some ways that we can uh, cut down on our use of contentious words. Contentious words can be curbed. They can be deterred. They, and, and we can cut down on the use of our contentious words. And let me give you a few suggestions. First, Take responsibility for using contentious words. Own up to your use of arguing words. Admit you're using sometimes quarreling words. Acknowledge your use of sarcastic words. Be honest in the times that you've taught back to people. Um, concede your use of reviling words and confess your use of harsh words. Just own up to, okay, yeah, this has been me. Yeah, maybe it's not me today. It has been in the past, but we take responsibility for using contentious words and and own up to it. That's the first step in recognition. Okay, yeah, here's a, here's a problem. 
Secondly, we need to understand and thank God for His forgiveness. If you believed in Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, and who died on the cross to pay for your sin and give you eternal life and give you forgiveness of sins, then that sin this of contentious words and all the harm that it's called, caused has been forgiven. And you need to understand and accept that and, and thank God for his forgiveness. And if you've not yet believed in Christ, then this is the opportunity. You need to say, well, you know what? I need forgiveness for this because uh, these things, uh, as the Bible says, all of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God. These things included in that. James said, if you, you guilt, if you transgressed in one thing, you're guilty of all. The wages of sin is death. And so we need a Savior. We need somebody that's going to rescue us from the flames of eternal fire. And that person is Jesus, the only person by which we can be saved. And so if you've never made that decision to believe in Christ, then make today the day of your salvation. Put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ to save you and give you forgiveness of sins. And then quit being a contentious person. <laughs> and this may sound like it's oversimplification, uh, but, you know, put away the wine and the alcohol. Be an encourager, not a mocker. Keep confidences. Don't be a whisperer spreading around people's secrets. Humble yourselves before God and put away your pride. Put away your anger issues and be kind with your words. Uh, be contented with the spouse God gave you. Uh, mind your own business. Don't meddle in other people's business. And walk by the Spirit, not by the flesh, because God has given us His Spirit within us. If you believe in Christ, then Christ has come inside to dwell in you, and the Holy Spirit has come inside to dwell in you. And the Scripture says, greater is He that is within you than he that is in the world. And now we have the power not to be contentious people. We have the power to battle that sin nature, we have the power within us to have victory over using contentious words. So we have the power not to, and we need to take advantage of that power. And then second, we need to, uh, or actually fourth, we need to deal with deep-rooted sin. Recognize we have a deceitful heart. Uh, recognize we have a sinful nature. But then we need to put off the old self, put on the new self, Paul said. Uh, Ephesians, Paul wrote to the Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 4, put on the new self, which in the likeness of God is being created in holiness and righteousness of the truth. That's our new nature that we have within us, created in Christ and the Holy Spirit when he comes in. We now have a new nature. We don't just have an old sinful nature. We have a new nature. And so we can deal with the deep-rooted sin issues. Of, of anger and, and pride and these uh, selfishness that we have and, and battle the issues of the heart and our old nature. So, and Jesus said to his believing disciples, he said, if you want to be my disciples, you must de deny yourself, take up your cross daily and follow me. And so that's the exact opposite of what the, the proud person will do, the conceited person, the self-centered person. Die to self. And, and Paul said, you know what? Um, I'm crucified with Christ. The life I live, I now live by faith in the Son of God. And so it's, it's no longer I who live. He says it's Christ who lives within me. We, we die to self and live for Christ. And we be angry and not sin, Scripture says. Uh, there, not all anger is sin. It's only when we held on to anger is an emotion. You can't control your emotion whether it comes or not. You're going to get it. Somebody does something, you're going to get angry. It's what you do with that anger that counts. Are you going to forgive the person and release the anger? Or are you going to hold on to it and get bitter and become a contentious person? Last, we need to decide to replace contentious words with gracious words. And, we, and it comes back to the challenge I made last week, the memorizing of Ephesians 4.29, let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word that is good 
for edification, building somebody up, that it, according to the need of the moment, that it gives grace to those who hear. So here's the life challenge. We need to be a person of grace using gracious words, not a contentious person using contentious words. And that's a matter of letting the Holy Spirit control us and so that we do have the, the victory in these areas. So uh, hopefully this will be encouraging to you. This will be encouraging to us as a body of Christ that we might uh, put away the contentious words and, and use words of grace and kindness, words that edify and build up and encourage. And, and now we're going to turn the corner. Next week we're going to start talking about encouraging words and words that, are, uh, that produce encouragement and, and growth uh, rather than strife and, and challenge. So a good way is we prepare for the Lord's Supper. The Scripture says, let a man examine his heart, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. So we uh, just use this time as, uh, as I pray and the men come forward. We'll have a time of silent prayer and, uh, and just examine your heart about these contentious words and, and you being a contentious person. And let the Spirit of God work as he convicts. Just agree, take responsibility. Thank God for his forgiveness and, and decide let's, let's move on and, and grow and walk in the, in the Spirit, not in the flesh. So let's pray. And I'll take a, just a minute of silence where you can just kind of do some soul searching and, and just a time of accountability before God in your walk with him.